we've been talking the entire day about the history of our community as a Hispanic community, dating back to the late 1800s. We stopped at a timeline on the corner of Niagara and Porter, where the Hispanic Heritage District begins, where Avenida San Juan begins. And I shared with the Madam Chairwoman and her staff, Jonathan, and also uh, Yun, Jo Yun, I shared with her the timeline of what really shaped our community right from the late 1800s to the present. And let me tell you, I told the chairwoman, I said, and this history continues because today that goes on the timeline, her arrival here in Buffalo, New York. And you can clap. <laughs> I'd like to welcome you, Madam Chairwoman and Madam Majority Leader. I'd like to welcome you as well. And I'd like to thank you on behalf of our entire Hispanic community for everything you have done to make this day possible. We met with you, and your exact words was, I want you to put a letter together and send it to the Madam Chairwoman and invite her to Buffalo on the first stop to the Somos on the Road trips that she's going to make across the state. And she backed up that request. You know, we're, very, we're a very proud community. I don't want to talk too much because I'm very excited today. I'm excited for many reasons. Yeah, because, well, <laughs> because this visit is very important, important for our board of directors. And our board of directors is here. And you're going to hear them with the presentation. It's a volunteer board of directors. We do not have a paid staff. But one thing that this board of directors has is passion for community progress and for the future of our community. Some of them work, some of them are retired, but they work 24-7 for this community because they're on call 24-7 for this community. And the passion and the dedication and the commitment that they have rubs off on all of us as an organization, as a council, and as a community, because we want to see a better future for our children. We want to see a better future for our community. Buffalo is going through a renaissance, and thanks to our governor, he's invested millions of dollars here in Buffalo, New York, to help the economic landscape, and with that economic landscape, and with that renaissance is our community as well. And with that, I want, we want to share with you today how we fit into that renaissance. And thanks to our majority leader, thanks to our mayor of Buffalo, thanks to our Erie County Executive, thanks to our, our delegation, New York State Senator Kennedy, Assemblyman Sean Ryan, okay, and all the upstate New York State delegation, we're at today because of their help, because of their support, because they support not only our organization, but our community. All the leaders of our community, and some of them are here. Gino Rusi from Hispanos Unidos de Buffalo, that represents also Acacia Network. Gino. <laughs> David Rodriguez, which is also part of that component of Hispanos Unidos de Bofa. And our doc, Dr. V. Yes. From G -Bond. And his lovely wife, also an officer of G Bond, Tony Vasquez. And our RDC Regional Development, the RDC representative on the Empire State Development, Rosa Gonzalez. And Eunice, everyone knows Eunice <laughs> Lewis, who is also part of our steering committee and also organized this visit for our Madam Chairwoman. And a SUNY trustee. And a SUNY trustee. <laughs> and also our council member, David Rivera. <laughs> and Lou Santiago, he's part of the G Bond Network. 
Enterprise, Camille Brandon, which is one of our consultants, lobbyists in Albany. And if I forget someone, please do not blame my mind. Or don't blame, don't blame, how do you say it? Don't blame me. Don't blame me. <laughs> but with that, also Russ Gagino, he's part of our steering committee. He's with us. And Jose Rivera, also a stout the supporter. The other one. Jose Rivera, the, this one. Uh, you, you first. I'm going there. I'm the going there. One. Jose Rivera. Okay. And our assemblyman, Jose Rivera. Let me tell you a story about Jose Rivera. In 2009, I've never been to Albany. I've never been to the state assembly. I've never been to the chambers. And I went there for one purpose. I went there advocating to keep the Waterfront Health Care Center open because at that time it was owned by Collider Health and it was on the bridge to close. And we formed union, community, and Collider around the table to work on a plan to keep that facility open. And I went to Albany. At that time it was Sam Hoyt, our assemblyman. Mark Schroeder was our assemblyman. I don't recall who the senator was, but the first guy that I met at the door of the assembly chamber was Jose Rivera. And he took me around that same day and said, look, these are the people you need to see and need to talk to to keep that center open. And today, that center is open at 207th Street because of the help and support we've gotten from this gentleman and our upstate delegation back then. So with that, no further ado, I'd like to turn it over to our secretary, Dr. Tamara Sase, and she will present, uh, our VP will also be presenting some of the information on this uh, presentation, and also our financial officer, Esmeralda Sierra. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm so happy to see you all here. Isn't this a beautiful facility? Yes. Yes. On the facility, this is the first school where I started teaching quite a long time ago, uh, and it didn't look like this at that time. And they've rebuilt it, and it's absolutely lovely. It rivals any suburban elementary school, and our children deserve it. They deserve a beautiful facility and a beautiful place to uh, to learn. And so this makes it even more compelling this beautiful facility that we're going to be presenting to you today because our community deserves a facility like this. And so uh, we'll, we're going to start with just quickly the agenda. We're going to talk about the mission and the background. We're going to go over the physical plant of the facility and then what some of the costs and the budget are, what our strategies are for raising the money and, um, and what community outreach we have done and plan to do. So, we want to welcome and convene the Hispanic Latino community, our neighbors and friends, not just our community, but our neighbors and friends, to celebrate and promote Hispanic heritage and to learn about it. Uh, we will inspire our community through engagement, engagement in history, arts, science, literature, technology, and other areas of enrichment that mark our past accomplishments, and we've been collecting those past accomplishments, and as Cass said, we're creating the history for our future generations as we speak. Uh, and we want to uh, provide a pathway to success now and in the future for our youth. And of course, the development of this uh, Hispanic Heritage Cultural Institute will happen within a context that already exists. We have a thriving Latino community here. Thriving in some ways, but having needs in other ways. And so uh, the, part of the context is in the arts and the history and the culture that we bring. We know that we have a lot of assets that we want to highlight, we want to share, and we want to uh, enhance. Uh, and that these have a social impact, they have an educational impact, and they also have an economic impact because the arts and cultural institute brings, uh, arts and cultural industry brings billions and billions of dollars into, the country, into our nation every year, into our city, uh, because it's not just the dollars that are spent 
uh, with regard to that institution, but it's the tourism that it brings. We are here at the Gateway of Canada, and we are, we are welcoming people from all around the world that come to visit Niagara Falls. They come from Canada, they come from all over, and, and we're right here at the Gateway to, that, to Canada. Uh, as the Buffalo region is experiencing this renaissance, we want to be sure that our community, the Latino community, like other communities, is also being lifted. We need to make sure that all the boats are lifted uh, with this economic renaissance. Uh, we know that, I'm going to just slow down a minute. We know what an impact this can have uh, socially. In Minnesota, for instance, in Minneapolis, uh, with the establishment of a Native American cultural corridor, it revitalized not only a neighborhood, but uh, added to the revitalization of the city of Minneapolis. And, um, and it, uh, it's been happening all over the country. Uh, the next context is our youth. Our youth are such a resource for us for the future. They are, they are going to be the leaders of our community. And we know that the Latino school age population in the country has tripled since 1980. It's doubled just in the, in the Buffalo School since 1999, and it's continuing to grow. One in five students in Buffalo schools is Latino. And we have to make sure that uh, the cultural assets that we have available to them, the education uh, that we provide them, is at a level that's going to take them into the future to become those leaders, that's going to inspire innovation. Uh, that they uh, are part of the research that informs the decisions that we make about the future of our community. And so um, we have to invest in the future of our Latino youth in order to invest in the future of America. Um, Uh, there was a recent study by the University of Pennsylvania done in uh, areas where uh, cultural centers um, were developed in New York City, and stu students that attended museums and cultural <coughs> institutes showed an 18% decrease in serious crimes in those neighborhoods, a 14% decrease in child abuse. It had all kinds of social impact, and of course increases in educational attainment, graduation, and results beyond uh, the K-12 schooling. And then, of course, uh, the context of economic participation. I talked a little bit about the type of economic development that a cultural arts and culture can bring. And not just the arts and the culture, but the, uh, the research that will be conducted Having uh, this institute be a model for other places. Uh, one in three new workers joining the workforce is Hispanic, and it's expected that by 2050 it'll be one in two. And 60% of the workforce was unskilled in, two, in uh, 1960, but in 2000, 65% of the workforce needed to have skills. And what they've uh, found of the Latino population is that uh, a great percentage, about 60% of Latinos are in unskilled jobs now and they need to learn those digital skills of the future because artificial intelligence is coming and it's going to replace a lot of those unskilled jobs. So our people need to learn about artificial intelligence and they learn to, need to learn the digital skills and technology that will take them into the future. Uh, in New York City, there was a project called Growth with Equity that acknowledged uh, neighborhood economies and the importance of uh, developing all the different communities. And so while we have pockets of, of great uh, prosperity going on, we want to be sure that that reaches our west side in the Hispanic Heritage District. We also have a lot of research uh, that we've conducted in preparing for this on uh, the average wages for people of color in the city being well below those of their uh, white counterparts and um, 
that in areas of poverty, there's been a disinvestment uh, and lots of open, uh, empty lots. And that has a social impact on the community. And uh, so the place where um, the site that you saw where the Hispanic Heritage Cultural Institute will be built is, an, is a vacant lot right now. And we want to be sure that uh, our Hispanic Heritage District has a thriving, uh, this will be a cultural anchor for that area that will attract people from all over. And excuse any redundancy. Uh, so some of the key design elements, we want to be sure that we're building capacity which is to uh, leverage our cultural strengths and assets, and it's not a service-based model. This is really important to acknowledge. That we're not here to replicate anything that's already happening. We have some agencies doing fantastic work for our community, like Hispanics, Hispanos Unidos, the Bufalo. We have the Bell Center. We have uh, Westside Community Services that are providing services after school tutoring, uh, services for um, people of all ages, for seniors. That is not the, the aim of this institute. It is to elevate uh, the level of learning, the intergenerational uh, connections for our students, for our elders, and to pass on that knowledge, that beautiful cultural knowledge from one generation to the next. Uh, we want to be sure that it's scalable, that Whatever we do is something that can become a national model and is replicable. So we'll be gathering research, we'll be partnering with the University of Buffalo and with other universities in the area so that their students can come in and do research. It'll assist our partner organizations in the community to do research on their own uh, outcomes and plan for better reaching the community in their areas. Also, uh, we want to be sure that it's re relevant to the skills of the future. We are, need to prepare students now for jobs that we don't even know what they'll be. But by having a, a model that's responsive and by providing projects uh, that are grounded in research and, um, and on the cutting edge of what's needed, we can ensure that uh, our community stays abreast of national trends. Uh, we don't want to duplicate current resources again. And through collaborations, we will act as a convener, we'll be a catalyst and a connector, bringing resources together for not only for us, but for our partner organizations, so that we can have a deeper impact for our entire community. And again, not just the Latino community, but the entire community. We will be a place that immigrant and refugee communities can also uh, uses a model, uses a resource, and help to grow their communities by uh, accessing the facilities that we will have available to them. Uh, our key programming areas will include experiential learning, and this is so important because we want our students to really feel a connection between what they're learning in school, what they're learning in their after school programs, to real life and to what they're doing in, uh, in their future. We want to connect to arts and wellness, and there's lots of research that shows, again, the effects of arts and culture on actual physical wellness. And, um, and then the cultural affirmation and expression. Students need to know who they are. Students need to know who they are in order to really um, know who they're going to become and to really fully actualize their futures. And lastly, entertainment. We can't uh, overstate the importance of entertainment that's culturally relevant as well. We will have a, a theater in the facility that will, wel that will welcome Raices Theater Company. Uh, we will have cultural performances. We will have readings, stage readings of plays and readings of literature, poetry, uh, music and dance. Uh, it's also important and such an important part of our culture. And so we make a commitment to celebrate our culture, to collaborate with our partners, to connect with all the resources available in the community and with other communities, and then to contribute to the future well-being and prosperity of our community, our Latino and our entire Buffalo, Western New York, national and international with the connections 
uh, being right here on the border to Canada. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Casimiro, who's going to talk about the physical plant. Thanks very much, Tamara. This is where the rubber meets the road. Uh, we just toured this location just before we came here. And this is the footprint, which is located right in the corner of Niagara and Hudson. We have site control of the entire area. From, uh, you know, a private developer, the city of Buffalo has also been very gracious to uh, uh, designate or give us uh, designated developer, developer status. And we have site control in the entire area. This is the area where the facility will be built, a 33,000 square feet facility, and this is the parking area to uh, support the facility because we do not want to be a burden to the, to the surrounding community in the neighborhood. We want to have parking, off-street parking, to be able to support the facility. Am I doing this right? How do you do this? Space bar. Huh? Space bar. Space bar? Oh, okay. The first floor, and this is pretty hard to see, but some of the illustrations are right up on the, uh, on the uh, uh, visual boards there. The first floor consists of 30, uh, 15, around 14, 13,000 square feet. You have the museum, cafe gift shop, you have an activities hall that will support the theater. The theater will be a 150 uh, capacity theater. The second floor, and this is where it gets very interesting, the experiential learning labs, the offices to support the experiential learning, the media center, radio and TV, and the balcony to the, uh, to the field. Now one important component about the media center, this past weekend I attended a, a grassroots radio conference in Rochester, New York. And this conference brought in people from the national level, consultants, technical people, and so forth. And this conference had several workshops. And one of the uh, experiences that I shared with the folks at the uh, grassroots radio conference is that we have 45,000 Hispanics here in Buffalo. We have 75,000 in Western New York. And our community does not have a radio station that communicates, informs, or educates our community. And I was very clear. I said, you know, I see this as a civil rights issue. Immediately when I said that, around 10 folks came to me after that discussion. They offered to come here with no charges attached to do an assessment of what we can do to get a radio frequency here dedicated to a radio station for Latinos. And these are the type of partnerships that you have to go and get them. They're not going to come to you. you got to go and get them to be able to do an impact and move your community forward. So in the next couple of uh, months, I'm going to be reaching out to the community-based organizations in our community and to all the leaders. So when, the, when these team of folks come to Buffalo, we're going to sit down as leaders of a community and let them know what our needs are as it relates to radio and also TV. 45,000 Latinos, we have a TV station. We have it on cable, Telemundo, Univision, and what have you, but we don't have one here. Apart from that, this media center, what we want to do and we want to network with Channel 2, 4, and 7, WBFO, WNED, which we have a very good relationship with. <coughs> we met with all the general managers to these stations. We want to have programs here so that our high school children can come to the institute to get into journalism, get into TV, get into radio, give them an opportunity. Buffalo, 2, 4, and 7. No Latino, Latina, anchor, newscaster, whatever. We don't have that. We don't have that. They've had them before. They've left. Not replaced. 
You know, so that, that, that's something that we want to look at, we want to nurture, we want to foster, we want to work with our networks, we want to work with the general population to be able to fill that gap. The third floor will be dedicated to office space for the arts and cultural organizations. If they like to have their office, there's a few right now. For example, the Hispanic Women's League, the Puerto Rican Hispanic Day Parade, you know, Bate, uh, Dance Theater, all these cultural groups do not have an office. We, we're very fortunate to have an office at the Buffalo and Erie County Central Library. We've been there for three years. But our partners in our community, they don't have a place where they can hang their hat on or execute their mission. We want them to be part of this as well and have a place where they can operate and where they can better serve the community. So we'll have office space not only for the arts and cultural, but also rental space for those uh, businesses or those uh, 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 partners that would like office space in the community. You know, ever since the beginning of this year and part of last year, we put a timeline together, very rigorous timeline with milestones, with all our consultants, okay? We have consultants that are working on this project that have been there. We have architects. We have uh, business planners. We have research and marketing. We have capital campaign coordinators. We have grant writers that have been there and done that. You know, we ain't got time to waste in our community. We want to do it fast. And we put a timeline together and met every milestone to this project. At our breakfast this past year, or this past uh, couple of months, June 22nd, we announced our capital campaign, a $10 million campaign. The first folks to contribute to that capital campaign was our board of directors. We raised $60,000, <coughs> our board of directors, to put in the kit. Collider Health, ECMC, our partners, uh, our council member, David Rivera, you know, our Erie County Executive awarded us, and we'll get into that, like 500000 from the capital projects, and we'll get into that. But, you know, we've been, we're, we're in the midst of the capital campaign, and we're very confident, believe me, we're very confident that by next spring, late next spring, we'll have $5 million committed or in the bank so that we can put a shovel in the ground. So that we can inaugurate it in 2021, Hispanic Heritage Month. So during this time frame, in 2021, we want you to come back and cut that ribbon with us. With our majority leader, with our mayor, with our county executive, with our councilman, and with all our elected officials that help our community move forward with this institute. The budget will be taken care of by our financial Officer Esmeralda Sierra. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Um, as you can see, we have a pretty um, comprehensive budget. We included from the soft to the hard costs on regards to construction, also all the development expenses, which bring us to a total of over $10 million. So we know it's very ambitious, but we trust that we can make it happen. So how we're gonna make it happen? Different ways. First, we already started a fund drive. Our main goal is to raise the first almost $500,000 to be able to make sure everything is in place. This basically will cover the development soft costs and all the pre pre preliminary costs which include the land acquisition, the architectural fees, preliminary of course, site conditions and inspections. We make sure we have the feasibility study. So these are all things that we need to have in place. So this money is gonna go a long way to make sure we can make this happen. And it is happening already. We are very grateful to the donors that have already pledged, as Casimiro mentioned, we have our board, they were the first one, the entire board pledged their support. We are all in for supporting this. We already have pledges of almost $50,000. We're 
which is knowledge that it's coming. We know it's coming. Other than that, we have a commitment of a million, half a million dollars, which we know already is coming too. And so far, we have received over $66,000. And this is what make us uh, make possible that we move forward with all the plans or all the projects that we have at hand. Um, so. Before you leave this chart, uh, but I'll, let me just share something uh, with them is that if you look at this chart, $5 million, because we've identified the funding sources, you know, $5 million from New York State, $2 million from the capital campaign, $1.5 million from the local foundation, $1 million from public funding, and $500,000 from corporate grants. Currently, currently, we've got a, a CFA application in for $1.5 million. It was reviewed by the RDC, local RDC, scored a 10. <laughs> scored a 10. Let me tell you why it was scored a 10. The application was due on July 26th. July 30th, we got word from our county executive that he awarded 500000 That could not be part of the application because it missed the deadline. The $350,000 that we have for the Oshai Foundation, that the uh, proposals in for the Oshai Foundation, where they told us that they're going to help us, cannot be part of the application because it missed the target. You know, so these are the things that put us in a big, big risk when this application gets to the state that the governor and the governor people look at the Empire State Development and the state say, look, they deserve that $1.5 million. Let's give it to them. And that's what we're hoping and praying that it happens. So this project will be subsidized, as you can see, by different uh, funding streams. We are diversifying to make sure we don't only count on one fund stream. So we gotta make sure it's diversified. We have funding coming from all different areas, not just private, but also foundations, corporate, public, and individuals, which already have given a great support. In, in foundations, as mentioned before, we have some of them, the Buffalo Teachers Federation, we have Caleta Health, we have Buffalo Common Council, MNT. Those are some of the corporations that have decided to support us. In addition to, have, to that, we have an, a, a huge array of individuals that have said yes to the project and have already committed and have been giving us money. As I mentioned, as Imino mentioned, the SSD uh, Development Fund was also, which is one and a half million. So funding in regards to grants, we're gonna go for local <coughs> foundations, government, corporations, local, national, banks, national foundations, donations, private and public. In addition to this, I wanna say that we are looking to have other opportunities like naming rights. We're gonna provide naming opportunities at the center. So whoever wants to honor someone will be recognized. They are many, many different naming opportunities also as part of our funding. Again, we need to diversify and bring funding, funding from different areas to make sure this is gonna happen because we are looking for sustainability. We don't want to just build a building, have it empty, and then in five years it's going to be closed because what happened. So we are looking to keep it going, keep it open, keep programming happening, keep people coming in, and not just coming in because they feel they have to, but because they want to. We offer things that they are looking for. These are some of the, the plans we have, including a space and office, office rental. As mentioned before, we invite not just the Hispanic cultural organizations, but any cultural organization that wants to be housed in our building is more than welcome. Anything that is going to be for the betterment of our community, we welcome with open arms. We are going to have, in the different spaces, you see we have a theater, we have a, a, a whole room. So we are going to be able to rent spaces, have programming, events and programming, Include the programming, we have programming for different, uh, I don't know if you're aware, we have wonderful guitar project that is already going on. In a few years, when we have, because we're going to have the center, when we have the center open, we're going to be able to offer the program right there and welcome all the kids to come to the guitar um, project classes, which, by the way, are completely free. That's what we're trying to do to educate and do boarding in the community. We're looking, looking for resources outside. We're going to be having a cafe where we're going to be serving foods and drinks. That's going to be a revenue too gift shop, also souvenirs, and specifically Hispanic 
souvenirs and little trinkets is going to be offered there too. And we are committed to get 10% of each, all, each dollar raised will be allocated to an endowed fund. The fund will grow over the years and exist in perpetuity. This is a big one. We want to keep it going forever. We don't, we don't want it to, over, to be over. So the proceeds will, uh, from the fund will help to sustain the program. Once we have a program, you know, you need grant funds sometimes to start a program. But hopefully with these funds, even if for some reason we lose a grant, it's going to be there. We want to keep it going. And with the help of the community and, and your support, I know we're going to make it happen. by our BP, Michel Agosto. Yes. I don't see a yearly um, operation uh, line on this. Because right now we are looking just at the building. That's going to be a separate. This uh, budget that we have right here right now, it's the building, the budget for the building phase. We don't have included in this budget that the operational cost. Yes, thank you. What, what was the question, ma'am? Operational funding. The operating cost? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Very good. Because there, there, is, there are costs associated with yeah. that. Yes. You have a light, you have other things that you yeah. have to pay. I see the insurance. I see all of these things attached here, but I don't see the real operational yearly cost. Yes. Well, that, that's, a, that's a very good question you bring up. The Magellan Group. And this is a, uh, a business planning group that's helped other cultural groups in the area, like the Botanical Gardens. They've done work with the History Museum, the Zoo. I think they did work with the New Explorer more as well. These are our business planners. They're putting together a one, two, three year startup plan with operational plan, with operational cost, how much it's going to cost. To, to operate on the first, second, and third year. Yeah, taking into consideration, for example, that the first year we have to do the hiring and all that, that then go from there. So that's, again, it's, it's a separate. And, and I love the presentation, it's phenomenal. Uh, but I, I am sure that Madam uh, Majority Leader would agree that you need that piece in, the, in this proposal, especially as it pertains to the state, because they want to know where you are you getting uh, any funding from in that educational component, you know, or the cultural component. You know, try to figure out um, just a suggestion. No, no, I where, appreciate it. Where Thank you so much for the feedback. I appreciate it. Right, because you need a, a, a regular funding stream mm -hmm. to be able to operate. It shows yes. sustainability. Right, right. Yes. exactly. And, you know, if you build it, you know, they will come. That's mm -hmm. the bottom line. But you still have to show some sustainability. Kind of yes. okay. We'll make more that detail, part more detail, more detail, more detail. Yeah. Just the operational cost, at least a five-year plan. Okay. And, and your point is very, very well taken because it's directly linked to sustainability. Exactly. Yes. Question. Oh, sorry. Yes. Um, what are you looking in terms of the entity and the, the tax status of it? Um, is it a five hundred one c three or something else that? You can take advantage or leverage. Well, our, our organization. Our, well, right now the Hispanic Heritage Council, which is the, the one spearheading the spearheading the project, we are already in a five one three. So we're a nonprofit already. So and it's under our umbrella. So it will be covered right now. Can I also make another suggestion? Mm -hmm. Apply for the five hundred one C four as well. Okay. Because you, if you're going to be um, soliciting private funding. You can't do it with a 501c4. Okay. You have to have the 501c4 as well. Okay. Perfect. Thank you so much for that. Any other questions? Well, if there is no more questions, now I introduce a Michelle, our VP. <laughs> Thank you so much again. And this, and, and this is part of the business plan with the goals of the strategy. Okay. We're looking at fiscal viability and measure, okay? Engaging in program and, and activities that are fiscally responsible with measure of success. Every program, educational program, experiential, uh, experiential learning program that we designed 
as far as the edu educational component of this. We want to make sure that it meets the needs of the population, meets the needs of our children and our community, and at the same time have measurements. Is it meeting the needs? What do we need to? Uh, that's right. So we want to, you know, we want to make sure that we that we follow the trends and we improve over time to get better. External and internal focus, considering external collaborative opportunity as well as internal mission. External collaboratives. We have a very good relationship with the arts and cultural community here in, West, in Western New York. There's 52 cultural organizations. If you look at our calendar uh, for Hispanic Heritage Month, we got over 15 events during Hispanic Heritage Month at the Science Museum at the zoo, at the botanical gardens, at the history museum, at the library, you know, where we take cultural programming to expand our mission as far as understanding, awareness, and so forth. Uh, another external uh, uh, partner, New York State Council of the Arts. Our organization, the Hispanic Heritage Council, the Puerto Rican Hispanic Day Parade, uh, the the, uh, the, the Pucho Olivesa Community Center, as far as the uh, Greece Pole Festival, we do not tap into those resources for funding. We have to open those avenues. That's why when I was up in, up in Albany with John Sanabria during Somos, we met, we met with Jose Serrano. We met with his staff. We shared with him what our plans were and that, you know, we need, we need, we need to open those doors. We need to open those floodgates. Innovative change, developing innovative program with our partners and create opportunity to address positive outcomes. You know, we were at UB today speaking with, with the president of UB. And one of the areas he touched on was experiential learning. You know, our medical institutions that we have a very good relationship, whether it be Collider Health, ECMC, Roswell, we want to have those relationships, build those relationships so that we can enhance opportunities in this center through collaboration. You know, the, 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 uh, the social determinants of health, you know, it's a proven fact that if we do what we want to do, that's going to affect that in the long run. Capacity to develop, develop internal capacity to a focus on system and product to meet needs of the growing organization. As we go, we want to continually improve. We want to, want to meet the needs of the community. We want to be better. We want to uh, enhance our programming to be, to be engaged in the development of people. We know that with this new institute, our board is going to change drastically. Our staff needs to be a qualified staff. We want nothing but the best. We want nothing but the best to lead our community into the next sector. With that, Michelle will go to the right BD. Closer. Be ready. I'm the closer, all right? Uh, so, no, it's close. It's close. All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit of community outreach, which is very near and dear to my heart. And we want to ensure that the Hispanic Heritage Cultural Center will serve as a valued resource to Latinos and others in our region. That's really important. The newcomers are new Americans, all people within our region, and serve as a national model for harnessing community potential. And so we want to make sure that what we do is similar to our, our sisters and brothers that have worked on the African American Heritage um, Corridor, where we um, come together for a similar purpose, and that's to celebrate the cultural um, relevance and importance of that neighborhood and that community. And so we want to do that for our community and for our Latinos on the West Side. And so we're hoping to follow their lead and how they received funds to and so um, I know they were um, positive and uh, persistent, and we want to f uh, do that too. We think that um, we are should be as valued as that area. And we will fight for that because that's really important for our community. We want to make sure that um, we, I feel like I've lost a slide. Okay. So we also want to make sure that we do all these, this outreach. Now, in New York City, I'm from New York City, there's several um, centers that serve Latino communities. We have the Museo del Barrio, we have the, um, the Cultural Center for the African Diaspora, 
we have a bunch of them there that's six hours away from us. And so we would like to kind of have that feel and that kind of, um, that uh, a provider of the cultural, the arts and history and research here. We want to serve the people that are here and also within our, our, our Western New York region, plus of course, our international friends and partners of, um, across the river New York. Um, and of course, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and so on and so forth. We can do some outreach that um, potentially people are missing out of because they can't get to New York City. So we can serve that purpose here. So we want to have a call to action. Our community deserves this. Um, we should have a place for our Latino our community and our friends of Latinos to come and celebrate and congregate and um, grow. And so we would like to have um, a place where our community members can come as, um, as, a, as, a, as one. A really important facet of this development was to make sure we talk to our community partners. So this is one element of that, but we have uh, been meeting with our community leaders individually and larger groups throughout the spring of 2019. We continue those conversations because the more transparent we, we are about what we want to do with this work, and how we want to serve all of, of us here in, the, in um, Western New York, in Buffalo, Latinos and otherwise, this is a really important message to make sure everyone understands. Um, we, I think Kaz already mentioned this, we announced this at the community breakfast in June, and the capital camp campaign was just, just started this month. Seems so perfect, it's got a heritage month. And we do have a PR team that is working with us on the media and the branding and the messaging to make sure that people understand what we're trying to do and that we're not trying to be an alternate service provider. That really this is about the arts, this is about culture, this is about history, this is about research, this is about learning and growth, um, developing our youth. And um, I'm all about that. Um, if you don't know, I also work in the, in the Buffalo Public Schools and the Arts Department. So this is all really important to me personally. And community meetings will continue to um, occur throughout the um, throughout the year. Okay. Um, again, these are community meetings that will be held. They have not been held yet at these locations. I think in Dunkirk there was one, but we'll make sure to hit all the regional, all those important places that we know there are lots of Latinos and lots of people who care about a project like this. We want to share this message. We want people to know that they are welcome, that this is their place too, and that we would love for them to invest not only time, but you know, every dollar counts. And no donation is too small. And that if you want to be part of this amazing um, future beacon of happiness, right, that they can invest and they could be part of the growth of this um, for future generations. Um, the renderings will also be displayed in public areas throughout the year and um, we'll probably have a calendar of those um, um, sites on the Hispanic Heritage um, website um, that can be shared with everyone who's interested. This is an organizational chart. Um, I'm not going to really go over that, but there's all sorts of components. We do not need a loan. We have a um, structure in place to make sure that we're all accountable for the things that need to happen for this to go forward. And these are our current partners, our architects, and legal counsel, construction management, business and strategic partners, PR, and uh, we have a grant writer now to help us along with some fundraising. Um, so like I said, I'm the closer, so I get to share um, the rest of our wonderful <laughs> board. We have an amazing board, a board of educators, of activists, of people who have been in this community for a long time and know the history of this community, people who care about being here in Buffalo and care about being Latino, um, care about our children, and I'm really proud to be part of this board. Of course, you can read that, but it's, it's a grand board. Um, and this is the steering com committee that kind of leads this, this particular work. Um, I won't read them, but you can see there's some really valuable partners here. Some are in this room right now. Um, and we really depend on the brains and um, passion of these people to help us make it through um, this process, which is going to not be always easy, but it's always going to be worth it. Okay.
And the Russians are very well known all over the world. Thank you. Uh, well, I just wanted to take it and make sure that, that you understood that not only is this a project that the Hispanic Heritage Council has put together, but this is a, a project for the community. And it's by the community. And it's something that we, as community leaders and uh, executive directors of the different agencies, support a, a thousand percent. Uh, we're making sure that uh, this, this building, this dream, that this becomes a piece of, of art that never goes away. From my, from my standpoint, part of the way that we're going to make it sustainable is that we are going to rent some space there uh, from the uh, Finals and Wheels of Buffalo to run some of our programs. It may be housing, it may be employment, something that will fit in with the clientele that's coming there. That's what we want to do, it, and I commit to CAS right from the very beginning that that's something that we're going to do. We're going to rent space there so they have uh, a source of income to sustain them. And I think there's a lot of other people uh, like, the, like Dr. Vasquez and, and other folks that could probably do the same uh, to help uh, bring in the monies to, to the organization for it to keep going. And by the way, Dr. Vasquez is also from Papillas. So <laughs> <laughs> I think we've got a bunch of us here. Uh, where's Seferino Lopez? There he is back right there. He's from Papillas also. So they well, bunch of us. I was born in Catania. There you go. Tell them about the call you just got. Oh, uh, yeah, I just got a call from uh, Senator Tim Kennedy, uh, and he's trying to help us with the project that we're doing across the street from Hub, which you'll, you'll see tomorrow. Uh, and he's trying to work with the governor to, to try to get that to, to happen. It's going to be uh, 46 units of uh, affordable senior housing. Uh, I think it's 14 apartments. Uh, for supported housing. Yeah, 14 apartments for supported housing. <laughs> and, and we know how in Puerto Rico you guys sit a, a, a senior building, and I have to tell you, I, I, was questioning whether that was a senior building or not. It was the swankiest building, the senior building I've ever seen in my life. It is a, it's a beautiful, it's, a, it's got a courtyard and flower yeah. beds all over the place and everything. We're working on some more. Uh, so uh, there's a group down there right now working with a couple of the, the, uh, the mayors down there to get that done also. But we're doing some projects up here too. And it's going to enhance what CAS is doing. Uh, I think. You know, I asked Raul one time, you know, when I came back, I was in Binghamton for a while, for about a year and a half, but I came back, I looked at the neighborhood and it was just destroyed. And I said, how the heck do you bring something like this back? He said, one block at a time. That's, That's right. right. That's correct. That's it. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Madam Chairwoman, uh, it's a tradition. It's a tradition for our organization that every time we get a visitor that comes to Buffalo, that we give them a token of appreciation. And for you and the assembly member, Jose Rivera, we have a token of appreciation. Where are they? First of all, the Oh, no, it's just Buffalo. You get a Buffalo. You want to see what Buffalo's are at. Well, I have to tell you that this is extremely symbolic for me because this was my very first stop. 
and I can't wait to see the rest of the state. But this, you set the precedence for everywhere else. And our assemblyman, Jose Rivera, can you please get a flower? No, 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 we got something for you. Can you get a flower? Can you get a picture? Can you slow it down? Assemblyman, for you as well, as a token of appreciation and to express our thanks and our gratitude for coming to Buffalo as well, we'd like to present you a Buffalo. I almost, asked, I almost asked my leader there, are there any buffaloes in Buffalo? Yeah, there are. Crystal, I finally got one. They play in hairs. Hey, this afternoon I want to thank you. So we were giving buffalo wings. Yes. <laughs> One quick story. You spoke throughout the day about Maria. <laughs> This young lady, when she went to Puerto Rico, she helped Puerto Rico by asking me to, to take her to go shopping. <laughs> <laughs> and she had me waiting for two hours outside. Of, what's the store? It's not shopping. Yes. <laughs> no store. No, she yes. wanted the economy. Yes. Yes. Yes.